The best of our knowledge explores topics on learning, education, and research. Coming up, not for the faint of heart, we'll join researchers collecting ticks during the fall peak of arachnid activity. Wildfire smoke detectors have been installed across New York State. And a champion basketball coach gears up for a fresh challenge. I'm Lucas Willard, host of The Best of Our Knowledge. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. Autumn in the Northeast brings the colorful changing of leaves and cooling temperatures. It also marks the high season for tick activity, a source of concern and anxiety for hikers, dog owners, and those who would otherwise enjoy the great outdoors. One biology class from New York University traveled upstate to participate in a long-term study of arachnid activity. The best of our knowledge is Jody Cowan brings us more. On an unseasonably warm October day, a group of 11 biology students from NYU traveled to the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook for a hands-on scientific field trip. Pulling strips of duct tape to seal openings on their protective jumpsuits, the students prepared to head out for a day of tick collecting. The students are looking for the adult ticks that were born in the spring. NYU Environmental Studies professor Mary Killalee says this time of year poses the highest risk of coming into contact with ticks and for the class's needs, the greatest chance of collecting them. So the end of October, early November is when adult ticks are most active. So this is a good time for us to go out and collect them. It also works well with our semester because we now have the second half of the term to do the type of data lab work that we want to do um, and analyze the data. Killily has published work with the Cary Institute on Lyme disease and tick ecology. At NYU, she and her colleague, Nikolai Kirov, a professor of biology, created the upper-level undergraduate course from the bench, Disease Ecology. As part of the course, the students are participating in a semester-long research project focused on Lyme disease, an illness that is transmitted through tick bites. This fall marks 10 years that NYU students have been coming to the Cary Institute for the Disease Ecology course. Professor Kirov said returning upstate helps students build connections to their current coursework. Basically, I don't see any better place, actually, than Care Institute to do this. They have, they have already a long-term established program, which we study also in class. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, basically, they have, they have grounds that are excellent for, uh, for our practical purposes. With protective clothing on, Kidley explained how the students will collect ticks. So when they go out into the field, we'll be carrying drag cloths. Um, and it'll take a little while um, for us to get our first tick usually. There's a little bit of insecurity about whether or not you're actually seeing them or missing them until we start seeing them. And then once we start seeing them, we start seeing all of them. Um, And usually it'll take us about an hour or two to collect about 20 to 30 ticks um, with three drag cloths and a dozen students collecting. The students split into three groups, equipped with a corduroy drag cloth, tweezers, and pockets full of specimen collecting vials. After about five minutes of searching, the first tick is located. Using tweezers to pull the tiny parasitic specimen from the drag cloth, student Olivia Shu takes note of the tick's color to determine if it's male or female before dropping it into a vial. Several yards away, Antoine Tran, who recently graduated from the NYU Stern School of Business, shares his group's tick hunting strategy. I think we're choosing areas where we would predict mice to be running along, so places that have trees and foliage um, where it would provide the mice with cover because mice are the primary targets for these lar- uh, for these ticks. So um, that's how we're hoping that the ticks will be camping out where they would get food. Tran says researching the ticks' food systems reshaped his understanding of his own larger ecological footprint. Um, so what we, a part of what we learned is how human urban development, and particularly suburbs, like actually increases the amount of tick density around um, where the suburb meets the forest because there's a lower density of large predators to uh, take out 
the smaller mice. And so that uptick in mice population also facilitates more ticks in the area, which is really interesting. Joseph Lee, who studies biology and computer science, said Lyme disease has been on his radar since his time as a Boy Scout, though his encounters with ticks up to this point have been limited. Fortunately, I haven't had, I haven't had any tick encounters. Um, I may have seen like a couple on my body, but nothing too serious. But because of the frequent exposure to wildlife and to like other sports that I might do that are also in the wild, um, I, it's always been on my radar at least. After about an hour, all of the adult ticks needed have been collected. Each group thoroughly checks themselves for hitchhikers. The next step will be to freeze all the collected specimens, bring them back to the labs at NYU, and for the students to isolate the collected tick DNA. While analyzing the ticks, students will look for the prevalence of Borrelia burgdorferi, a species of bacteria that can cause Lyme disease, as well as pathogens for other infectious disease. Comparing the data collected on this trip, students will be able to draw conclusions about the environmental factors that lead to higher rates of infection. Sukthi Gunda is studying biology. She says the disease ecology course opened her eyes to the type of work she would like to do more of in the future. Ecological bio is something that's very different to me, um, and it wasn't a class that I've taken before at NYU, so I thought it would be um, something nice to just finish off my senior year with, because since I've been taking classes in all different fields of bio, so this was the last thing that I was really missing. Um, and in the future, I do want to be a physician, and one type of physician I've been thinking about is someone studying infectious disease. So um, this class definitely kind of opened that realm to me, I would say. Professor Killalee says one of the major goals in taking this course is to better prepare students to look at the big picture when it comes to human health. And a lot of these students are actually global public health students, not ecology students. And so really their interests tend to be about what these crossovers are, like what are the, the ecological implications that affect human health. And I think um, that makes this course really relevant to them. For the best of our knowledge, I'm Jody Cowan. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. Before smoke from Canadian wildfires drifted into northeast states this spring and summer, about half of New York counties were equipped with air quality sensors. In October, the researchers at Cornell University announced that all 62 counties are now outfitted with a sensor. The devices can detect fine particulate matter of at least 2.5 microns, that's 28 times smaller than the width of a human hair. Cornell Cooperative Extension and the New York State Association for County Health Organizations helped install the sensors that are linked to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Fire and Smoke Map. The online tool allows users, including state environmental and health officials and policymakers, to view real-time atmospheric data. To learn more, I spoke with Dr. Corinna Knoll, Assistant Professor of Practice in Cornell's Department of Public and Ecosystem Health. Yeah, so kind of observing, we saw that over half the counties, or near half the counties in New York State did not have air quality sensors um, prior to this summer, and so this initiative has really worked to fill those gaps. So what can you tell me about this wildfire smoke this past summer, uh, there were days where it seems foggy almost or misty. Uh, it's, it's hard to see the horizon. The sun looks funny. But uh, what makes wildfire smoke different than, say, uh, a campfire smoke in your backyard? Yeah, so I think one thing is um, it's definitely more noticeable, right? It's, it's not isolated. You can see, you can actually see it. And if it's really bad, you can smell it. Um, so wildfire smoke has been shown to be actually more harmful than other types of pollution. And that is mainly due to, or it's been theorized to be um, thinking, if you think about the type of things that are burned in a wildfire, right? It's electronics in people's houses. Um, it's old building materials. So this is in contrast to like a campfire, the smoke from a campfire where you're just burning typically you're just burning wood. Um, and so, you know, we should be concerned about wildfire smoke. Um, it, it definitely presents a hazard that could potentially be worse than typical air pollution that, that we experience. Now, I wanted to ask you about particle size. So if I'm in a state a few hundred miles away from fires that may be, in this case, burning in Canada, do the smaller particles of the wildfire smoke actually travel farther? 
I don't know about traveling further, but the smaller particles are more harmful because it's thought that, you know, you breathe it in and then they affect the body in different ways as compared to those larger particles. And so when we're talking about wildfire smoke, we're mainly concerned with particulate matter um, of around 2.5 microns and potentially even smaller. The wildfires of 2023, I think, were surprising to a lot of people in an area of the country that normally doesn't experience such large smoke plumes so regularly. The sensors are now installed, so you must be worried about future similar events. Yeah, we definitely are. I mean, we see this project as kind of preparing us for this next time that we get wildfire smoke um, waves. Unfortunately, we think that these waves are here to stay and, you know, future years we are going to have similar problems. Um, At least now we have some data that can inform local decision making, either from public health or other agencies that are involved in kind of the response to this. And hopefully it will also be help us more on that local level to be able to inform consumers, um, citizens, when there are issues in their area that they should be worried about. So Cornell was able to help New York get sensors in every one of its counties, but I'm sure that's rather unique. Most states don't have wildfire sensors in every county. Yes, I think that's true. Um, Based on what, you know, we've observed on that EPA's wildfire and smoke map, which is actually nationally, if you look at that, you can definitely see gaps in in air quality sensors across the United States. Um, So I think there there is work to be done on more of a broader level to make sure that we're having we're being able to capture and provide in a real time manner, high quality air quality data specific to wildfire smoke. Now, will these sensors be running 24 hours a day, 365 days a year? That is the goal. So partners, um, Cornell Cooperative Extension partners in each of the counties have installed these sensors and uh, they're connected to a power source, also connected to Wi-Fi. So basically they are providing real-time data that basically automatically gets uploaded and connected to that EPA's wildfire and smoke map. Um, And this will provide kind of continuous monitoring, barring any major issues. Dr. Corinna Knoll is a researcher at Cornell University. You can view real-time wildfire smoke and air quality data at airnow.gov. For the best of our knowledge, I'm Lucas Willard. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. It's time to return to the court. It's college basketball season. The College of St. Rose, a private liberal arts college in Albany, New York, begins the new season with a new women's basketball coach. As Ian Pickus reports, the champion coach is gearing up for a fresh challenge. It's a late Friday afternoon in October, and Will Brown is teaching the Golden Knights a give-and-go set in the half court. They run the play again and again, with different groups of five practicing the timing and getting the ball into the lane. Brown is calling the shots back at the private Albany College where his coaching career began on the men's side in the 90s. I was here for three years and I I met some really good people. I met my wife here. My wife's got a degree from the College of St. Rose. So for me, it was my first opportunity. I met my wife here and to kind of come full circle and now on the women's side, uh, you know, uh, something new for me. But I always feel that Everything that you do, uh, you know, there has to be a growth and development uh, element to it. From there, he spent 20 seasons at the University at Albany, leading the men's hoops team to the Division I NCAA tournament five times. After parting ways with the Great Danes, Brown then served as head coach and general manager for the Albany Patroons pro team for one season in 2022. 
Now, Brown finds himself back in the college game, this time at the Division II level in the Northeast 10 Conference. And he's not here to lose. It's been an enjoyable experience so far. Um, you know, they have not, you know, some of these players, uh, I'm their third coach. And, you know, that's, that's difficult. And, you know, the one thing I keep hammer, hammering them with is we have expectations. You know, what's been done in the past isn't good enough. And, uh, you know, we're going to win. It's just a matter of when. The Golden Knights roster is dominated by former Section 2 standouts and skews young. Junior Madison Mahoney is from Latham and transferred from Fairleigh Dickinson. I think one of the hardest things that Coach Brown is enforcing on us is our mental toughness because I know that there's a lot of times during practice that, yes, we're all like physically tough, we'll go after each other for three hours a day, but another part that we still need to build up is on defense when you're tired, you need to be mentally tough and maintain solid defense. Sophomore Kayla Carter of Water Elite went to Shaker High School like Mahoney. We're beating each other up. Uh, not gonna lie, uh, but it's good. Like we need to be physical with each other because that just makes us a lot better for our opponents. Brown was busy getting his squad ready for an exhibition against ACC powerhouse Syracuse. But looming larger is the November 15th season opener for a team looking for its first winning season since 2016. Here on the women's side, uh, and I did my research um, and talked to some people. Um, if they trust you and if you develop a relationship with them, they'll do anything that you ask them to do. Brown says coaching female players for the first time is a learning process and relating to the players is part of it. It's a learning experience for me. When the games start and I'm on the sideline, you know, like we scrimmaged Merrimack the other day, yeah, you know, uh, I'm in my element, I'm in the zone. You know, it's just uh, the different personalities, what makes them tick. Whereas the men's side, after a scrimmage, if three or four players didn't play, they'd be sulking, they'd be waiting in my office for me. Three or four players don't play here in the scrimmage. You know, they don't say a word, they're, they're happy. You know, they're coming in my office like, hey, all right, I didn't play, hopefully I play next game. St. Rose's first home game is November 21st against Assumption. Reporting from Albany, I'm Ian Pickus. This is the best of our knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. As more colleges and universities are making courses in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math a priority, one university is also bolstering its efforts to help students retain their education in complex subjects. The university at Albany is opening new tutoring hubs to help every student stay on track. The best of our knowledge is Samantha Simmons has more. Learning Commons will serve as a one-stop shop for students looking for peer tutoring and What's supplemental instruction. This one, it would just be this chart. Students can meet right with peer tutors up to three times a week, online or in person. Chemistry professor and associate vice provost for Learning Commons, Robbie Ann Musa, says the new center could combat high attrition rates. We learned that if you can pair these tutors with up to 10 students for a particular course over the entire course of a semester, the end result is this dramatic increase in persistence, which means the students don't drop the course, and also graduation rates ultimately for STEM majors. STEM students make up roughly 2,900 of the more than 13,000 undergraduates at the university. A college spokesperson says attrition rates for STEM majors who re-enroll in non-STEM programs is disproportionately higher for those from underrepresented backgrounds. The new center is located between the lecture center and the main library. A space within the library is divided from a group study area and has whiteboards and private study rooms where students, tutors, and groups can meet. Housed within the Learning Commons is the Center for Achievement, Retention, and Student Success in the Excellence in STEM program. Here, students enrolled in first and second year biology, chemistry, and physics courses can receive free, tailored academic support meant to increase graduation rates within the programs. Welcome to the University at Albany Learning Commons! A $1 million grant from the National Science Foundation and a $2.5 million grant from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute last fall is being used to create a more inclusive, STEM-focused learning environment for all students. 
To tutor, students must have an A or A- in the course and go through training courses to learn how to articulate complex topics to others. And they must get a letter of recommendation from a professor who can affirm their abilities in that course. Once they're selected, peer tutoring becomes a paid position. Kosara Baid-Sharouf began tutoring students in math, chemistry, physics, and Arabic this semester after tutoring at Hudson Valley Community College. Obaid Sharouf says helping students helps her. I might be taking that course with different professor, and every professor provides the material differently. So I sometimes find new ways that I need to that I can solve that problem different than what I learned. So I actually need to learn their way so I can teach them what their professor teach in the class because I can't um, confuse the student and teach them what I know. I need to go with what they know. She says it's important to not make her peers feel like they're being supervised. Rather, they're there to learn from each other. Amelia Modalinia is being tutored by Obaid Sharouf. She uses CARS, which is required for students enrolled in a class with CARS tutoring. They do understand that aspect of that we are going through the same thing, we are going through the same problems, and they understand how difficult that may be. Campus President Javidan Rodriguez says UAlbany is one of the most diverse research universities in the country, and in order to continue to grow, new services to assist typically underrepresented groups is essential. We are meeting our students right where they are to give them what they need in order to be successful. Nayara Nichols wears many hats at UAlbany. She's a graduate student teacher, a Ph.D. student, and a tutor. Nichols says the center gives new life to the services. Before we had like a couple of rooms, they're kind of out of the way, hard to find sometimes. But having like this bigger space, it's in a high floor area, and it's like well decorated, it's just a lot more like happy vibe about it. I feel like it makes uh, the tutoring process more easy, and it, I feel like it makes more of like a communal area where people feel more welcome to come in and get help. But what about non-STEM fields? Sarah Rucker, an English and journalism double major, says the university often lacks resources for liberal arts students. On this campus, campus it's more STEM oriented, um, and I feel like any writing minor or major that is happening right now, like it's slowly being phased out. Like I know the English department, I think it's getting smaller. The journalism department is getting smaller. Um, so I don't know if it's strictly from administration or just like a lack of people wanting to do it. And it, that may be because they're pushing forward STEM related majors more because there's more out of it, they think. Rucker tutors in the university's writing center. She says engagement is low because students don't know what's there. When it comes to professors and stuff like that, they don't typically use the writing center all the time to push their students to work on their confidence when they're writing and stuff like that, it's never really coming from the professors. Reporting for the best of our knowledge, I'm Samantha Simmons. Officials in Burlington, Vermont, recently energized a new solar facility created by a public-private consortium. It will serve as a research and training facility for University of Vermont students. The best of our knowledge is Pat Bradley reports. The University of Vermont Solar Research and Training Facility is a partnership between the college, the City of Burlington, and McNeil Joint Owners. It was built by Encore Renewable Energy at the city's McNeil Generating Facility site. Independent Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders obtained $150,000 from the Department of Energy for the project. Burlington Electric Department General Manager Darren Springer explains the research facility has been planned for several years. The genesis of this was really that Senator Sanders had worked with the Department of Energy to bring one of five solar test centers in the country to Vermont, I think it was about a decade ago. And that was located originally at the IBM campus. And when that facility was being decommissioned, we were able to work with the senator and the Department of Energy and University of Vermont and other key partners to have some of that infrastructure and even some of the panels that were in use there come over to this new site for the Solar Research Center at McNeil. UVM junior Emily Neinstein is pursuing a degree in electrical engineering. She says a lot of the research that is currently done is based on simulations and models, and she's excited to start hands-on research. So we do a lot of math, we do a lot of coding, and all of that is really great, and we've been able to accomplish a lot with that. But to be able to have a real site where we can get Vermont data, 
is really exciting and will open up a lot of opportunity for us to explore some new research questions. So to be able to have our own source for solar data um, is really exciting. And they also have 11 different types of solar panels at the new site. So we'll be able to test how those solar panels operate in Vermont's conditions, which is something that hasn't really been done before because Vermont is a, is a unique climate and a unique environment. And we have a lot of solar panels here. So to be able to really understand what kind of solar panels we should be using for the conditions here will be really cool. The Burlington Electric Department will purchase all the energy produced by the solar array. Springer says it's only expected to produce enough energy to power about 11 homes, noting the purpose of the facility is research. This isn't necessarily a significant amount of energy production relative to our overall use, but it is still going to produce some solar energy that we will purchase and and benefit from as it also serves as a research hub. We really do have a vision for that entire plant site as being something more like an innovation hub. Obviously, we produce an important renewable energy resource with the McNeil wood chip plant, but we're also working on ways that we can utilize that differently, like with district energy, make that more efficient. This is an opportunity to do really interesting work with UVM on workforce training, on solar research. We see future opportunities at the plant as well. So this is really a tangible step towards trying to have that campus being an innovation hub. Neinstein says Vermont is a hub and leader for renewable energy, and the new facility will help push the envelope of energy technology. I think right now we have a lot of ambitious policies for incorporating renewable energy, but we don't have all of the science and the tools yet in order to actually facilitate that transition, and we don't have a large enough workforce really to make that transition possible. So pushing the envelope of technology, I think, is a combination of having the tools like the McNeil site to study renewable energy and study the problems that we need to tackle, but also to inspire students to start getting interested in renewable energy and to study electrical engineering or um, environmental science or something related to the renewable energy field which will help us all collectively push the envelope together. UVM will operate and manage the solar research and training facility. The City of Burlington and McNeil Joint Owners, which are the Burlington Electric Department, Green Mountain Power, and the Vermont Public Power Supply Authority, provides its site license. Reporting for the best of our knowledge, I'm Pat Bradley. This has been The Best of Our Knowledge, episode 1729. The Best of Our Knowledge is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. Thanks to associate producer Jody Cowan, the latest on all national productions programs is available via the Airwaves newsletter and our flagship station's website, wamc.org. Until next time, I'm Lucas Willard.